following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today's lecture is going to be about the three keys of suffering. And it's based on a quote, uh, one sentence that Samael Vior wrote in the book The Major Mysteries. If you've studied the books of Samael Vior, then you've discovered that in his writings, he will oftentimes place one sentence or phrase which can appear quite enigmatic, but he won't explain it. And this is particularly true of the books related with psychology. The reason that he writes this way is to encourage us to arrive at our own understanding. Samuel and Vior does not spoon feed the consciousness. He gives a very potent kind of wisdom. And in order for us to understand it, to make use of it, we have to digest that consciously to learn how to apply it to our own lives. And in that way, we can begin to extract the meanings. The beginning of that is to meditate to learn how to meditate on what we read, to contemplate what we read, and to reflect upon it in a deep way, in a practical way. In the book, The Major Mysteries, Samael M. Vior wrote a line that says, the three keys of suffering are the moon, the fornicating Eve, and the turbid waters. And that's all he said about it. He didn't explain. So in today's lecture, we will explore these three keys and how understanding these three keys shows us how we ourselves have the key to our own suffering. We have the tool that we need to unlock the cage of our suffering. And in fact, we are the ones who crafted that cage in the first place. The first key that he mentions is the moon. Of course, we understand in this tradition that when we read a scripture, we have to look at the, the personal meaning, the meaning in relation with our psyche, with our soul. We don't look to the literal meaning because that is the most superficial level. And as long as we remain in the superficial level, we will remain unable to make real changes. The moon, as a key of suffering, relates to our psyche. So we need to understand our own psychological moon. But of course, this psychological moon 
has an affinity or a relationship with the external moon, with the moon that we find in the sky, that moon that we observe with our sight. In the same way, if we observe the effect of the moon on the earth, we can understand the psychological meaning of the moon as a symbol. When we look at the tree of life, we see that Malkut, the tenth sphere, is related with the physical world in terms of external nature. But in relationship with internal nature, our own nature, Malkut symbolizes our own physical body. It is our own earth. And the moon of that earth is in relationship with Yasod and Hod, these other two spheres just above Malkut. The moon in the physical world, physically, influences the earth in a very profound way. We know this simply from studying materialistic science. And we see that the moon is behind all the phenomena of nature. The movement of the waters, our weather, conception, childbirth, the seasons, all of these things are profoundly influenced by the presence of the moon and its force upon, that acts upon this planet. In the same way, we have our own moon, which has this similar impact or effect on our psyche, on our psychology. When we study this interior moon in relation to the exterior one, we can understand that Yesod and Hod, these two spheres, are in relationship also with water, with conception. Just like the physical moon is in relation with these forces in nature. Yesod, which is just above Malkut, Yesod is the ninth sphere related with the ethereal plane. It's also in relationship with the sexual organs. So if we placed this tree of life superimposed over a human body, Yasod would sit directly over the sexual organs. And this is where we find the sexual waters from which life emerges. That force of creation is influenced by the moon. And we can see this in nature, how the processes of gestation, of conception and gestation and birth are influenced by the moon. Physical nature in this context, when we look at nature around us, we can see how this planet Earth is really one big organism, which is constituted by four primary kingdoms. The mineral kingdom is the largest, all the minerals, which are transformers of energy in that level of nature. And then there's the plant kingdom, which also has millions and millions of different forms and creatures, which are born, sustain, and die. And then we have the animal kingdom, with also millions of varieties of creatures. And then, of course, the humanoid kingdom. In each of these four kingdoms of nature, we see great waves of organisms who rise from birth to life to death. And as a scientist observing this world, we can see these waves or herds or collections of creatures moving according to the impulses given to them by the moon, the instinct which drives all of the organisms that, that live on this planet to procreate, to create children, to perpetuate 
the existence of that particular level of nature. And once the procreation process is underway, the parents gradually fade away and the children take over. And this process, this cycle repeats continually. New organisms are born, they grow, they become parents, they have offspring, and then they die. This cycle is the cycle of life, a cycle from birth to death, which exists in all the four kingdoms of nature. And this cycle of organisms rising and falling, living and dying, is all under the influence of the moon, which spins around this planet and orchestrates the entire mechanism. In other words, the moon is there to sustain life, to sustain the mechanical functions of nature. We have an atmosphere because of the moon. We have the life cycle of all these organisms and creatures because of the moon. The very life of this planet is tied up in the existence of the moon. And the same is true in us. Our psychological moon is in relation with our own instinct, our own animal nature which in its base seeks merely to sustain nature. All of us who exist in humanoid bodies carry within our bloodstream the inheritance of our time spent in these lower kingdoms. That inheritance is our animal inheritance or plant or mineral inheritance. It is the impulse that nature provokes in us, that our own moon provokes in us, stimulated by the external moon, to sustain nature, to grow up, to become parents, to have children, and then to die. As far as nature is concerned, this is all that matters. Nature doesn't care at all about our arts, our films, our TV, our ideas, our politics, whether we're male or female in particular, whether we believe in God or don't believe in God, nature doesn't care. All nature wants is to sustain itself, to perpetuate life. This is a mechanical law. It's a mechanical function. And all of us have this inheritance in our bloodstream. And it becomes particularly potent when we reach puberty. When nature, through the, its influence through the moon, pushes the waters of our sex to procreate, to find a creature of the opposite sex and to mate and to have children. That drive that sexual instinct is pushed by the moon. But how? If we observe this philosophical earth, which is our physical body, we see that it is also a very complex organism like the physical earth, which has a range of kingdoms and many organs, many parts, which work together in a very sophisticated way. But the central, most influential, most powerful force is the sexual instinct. It doesn't matter what your ethics, your religion, your politics, your stance on life happens to be. If your sexual instinct pushes you, it can cause you to go against your own morals, your own ethics, your own religion, your own politics. Your sexual instinct can push you to break a marriage, can push you to go against all of your ethical or moral or religious laws. And we see this happening all the time. 
as, as great an idea as we might have in our mind, or as much as we may believe in one doctrine or theory or another, that sexual instinct is the most potent force that drives the function of our psyche. As I mentioned, the sexual organs are in relation with the asad on the tree of life. That sexual function, the sexual instinct, expresses itself through our philosophical earth, the physical body. But it's driven, it's energized through the vital body, through the ethereal body, which is, in Kabbalah, Yasod. So to repeat, Malkuth is the physical body, Yasod is the ethereal or vital body. The ethereal or vital body has four, four ethers or four degrees or vibrations of energy. One of those four is related to conception. It's called the ether of life. And this is one aspect of this subtle body or body of chi that drives and pushes procreation in us. This is in relation with the Bible. If you remember in the Bible, in Genesis, we have the story of Adam and Eve. And this story has many levels of meaning in the macrocosm and the microcosm. But in relation with the three keys of suffering, we look to the symbols related to our own psyche. Adam in this level is in relation with the brain. Eve is in relation with the sex. And this is why when we read in the Bible that Eve is tempted by the serpent to eat of the tree of knowledge. That tree of knowledge is gnosis. It is da'at, the hidden sphere in the tree of life, which is the knowledge of tantra or sexuality. When Eve, in other words, our own inner sexual force, is tempted, it is because it is tempted by the fruit of sex. This also has levels of meaning. But in relationship with the three keys of suffering, we see that nature, the moon, influencing Hod and Yasod, pushes Eve, the force of creation, conception, to procreate, to have children. Adam and Eve also can symbolize the two serpents that rise alongside the spinal column, called in India, Ida and Pingala. Adam is related with Pingala, the solar or masculine force. Eve, or Heve, is related with Ida, the feminine or negative force, feminine force. Eve, again, is related with the force that pushes for conception, to have children. So when nature, the serpent, the force of the moon, influences our psyche to procreate through that instinct to support the mechanism of nature, this is that temptation, the temptation to follow that instinct, to feed nature, to follow the animal instinct. Obviously, in this context, we're not discussing the original fall. We're not talking about the historical significance. What we're talking about is now in our psyche the force of Eve in relation with the moon. When we answer to that animal instinct, the moon which is pushing us to sustain mechanical nature, we see all the human beings, all the intellectual animals in other words, guided solely by that instinct to sustain nature according to those mechanical laws. 
and the result is suffering. This is because conception in these times is not being guided by superior law, but by mechanical law. In ancient times, humanity would receive guidance as to the proper time for conception. Guidance from the priests, from the angels, from the awakened beings who guided the group of organisms called humanity. In the lower kingdoms, we see this is true even today. The collective mind, which rules all the lower kingdoms of nature, is guided by what are called archons, or rulers, authorities. These are primordial intelligences, which you can also call divas or angels. These intelligences provide guidance to their respective kingdoms. In the mineral kingdom, we have primordial planetary intelligences that guide the elements, the consciousness, the forces in those minerals to work in harmony with nature to spread and propagate and grow. And the same is true in the plant kingdom. Sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction that occurs in the plant kingdom occurs by the guidance of the intelligences of the divine. Likewise in the animal kingdom. The methodology shifts once again so that the re reproduction is a different form. But the animals in nature that is undisturbed by humanity. The animals only reproduce when they're in heat. When the moon guides those archons or rulers that guide each group to reproduce at the right time and only to sustain nature, only to propagate the mechanical functioning of the planet. But when we come to the humanoid kingdom, Things are different. We no longer even respect the guidance of the natural functioning of nature. Our own animal psyche has become so infected with degeneration, with lust, with anger, pride, envy, greed, all of those elements, that we no longer listen to the guidance of the archons of our level to those awakened spirits, beings, masters, angels, who can guide us. We don't listen anymore. We only listen to those residual animal elements symbolized by Esau in the Bible, which push us through our impure blood, through lust, through animal instinct gone mad, to procreate continually. Continually. Every day. Even some people have sex multiple times a day because that instinct is so out of control. And the result is that the human organism as a whole, the human race, that body, that organ on the planet has become very, very sick. The results are visible everywhere. Sicknesses and illnesses, not only physically, but emotionally, mentally, sexually. All of this is rooted in the psyche of mankind that has been hypnotized by the fornicating Eve, which, as you remember, is the second of the three keys of suffering. The first is the moon. The second is the fornicating Eve. The third is the turbid waters. The result of our psychological addiction to sex to those sensations is that our own waters have become impure. The waters are a very deep symbol. The lower waters, or the mayim in Hebrew, are related with the asod, which are the sexual waters. These are the waters that flow in all the different levels of our sexual um, vitality, physically, ethereally, astrally, mentally. All of these are related. The very basis of our life is sexual energy. The very point of the mechanical life is sexual energy. 
So we find sex is in the center, the center of gravity of all activity. And thus the root of our psychological problem is sexual. The fornicating Eve, by creating such a great disequilibrium in the function of nature, has created havoc on this planet. Every single problem that we face as a humanity is because of us. If our mind was not the way it is, this planet would be at peace. It would be an Eden. It would be a place of harmony and beauty. But because of our mind, we have corrupted not only our mind, but the entire organism. And that's why Mother Nature is now working to exterminate the disease. Mother Nature is reacting and producing cataclysms. This is all what we call cause and effect, or karma. The fornicating Eve, through the addiction to sex, has engendered in the sexual energy a great disequilibrium. So that now that energy does not function as it once did. Those waters are turbid, chaotic, confused, muddy. We now want to not talk about sex, to keep it private, to just keep God out of it. We don't want to have anything, any religious influence in our sexual life. We want to be able to do whatever we want to do and continue with the belief that there's no consequence, that there's no result from either the physical sexual habits we have or emotional sexual habits that we have or intellectual sexual habits that we have. But we have to remember that Jesus stated it very clearly. Even if you look at another person lustfully, you have committed a crime against the Holy Spirit. This is in the Gospel. This states explicitly that the sexual energy is intimately related with the functions of the mind. And this is why we know that the waters are also a symbol of the mind. In Buddhism, we see this symbol beautifully represented. The Buddha Shakyamuni, in the process of his enlightenment, conquering his own fornicating Eve, is faced with a great flood, just like Noah, just like Deu Kalion from the Greeks. That flood represents the karmic consequences of sexual degeneration. When those waters in our own self have become impure, and therefore the divine forces have to cleanse nature Otherwise, nature will spin completely out of control. Suffering becomes too great. The karma becomes too great. This is an automatic function of nature. When an impurity is too strong, nature obliterates it. This is a natural function. When a disease grows too much in a body, that body dies. The same is true of the human organism. Therefore, the waters that we've polluted through sex are the same waters of our own mind. In the Buddha's story, those floodwaters came and threatened his development. And what protected him was a great serpent named Mukalinda. That serpent represents the power of the Divine Mother, also called Kundalini, the power of Durga or the upright Kali, or Dumo, or Maya, or Maya, Maya, or Mary. All of these symbolize the same force, that sacred Pentecostal fire of the Holy Spirit, which protected the Buddha and raised him up on the water. And so he floated upon the water in the same way that Jesus walked upon the water. And Noah rode in the ark, or the arcanum of 
mystery, the secret knowledge. When we learn that science, it's a combination of learning how not only to work with the sexual energy in the right way, in harmony with the forces of nature and the divine, but also with the mind. These two go hand in hand. We'll come back to that. In synthesis, to understand these three keys of suffering, our own internal moon is in relationship with the ego, our inheritance of our wrong actions, the aggregates or red demons of Sep, as called in the Egyptian mythology. That ego or psychological I, which believes very much in itself and is very much attached to its desires, wants to propagate itself. The ego wants to spread itself. It wants to see itself everywhere. This is why ego means I. That I has nothing to do with God. That I is a legion of desires. That same legion that Jesus expelled from the demoniac in the gospel. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the man says, I am legion. Because he was possessed by a whole diversity of psychological elements called pride, lust, envy, anger, gluttony, jealousy. The ego is three because it works through our three brains, intellect, emotion, and sex. The ego is three because it is three traitors, Judas, Caiaphas, and Pilate. The same three traitors of Osiris, the same three traitors of Job, the same three traitors in every tradition. Our own three brains, influenced by the moon, to follow the mechanicity of nature. The moon is a cause of suffering because the moon only cares about the sustaining of mechanical nature. And how does the moon influence that and enforce that? Through collective thinking. To follow the herd. To imitate. The moon wants us to fit in to do what everyone else is doing, to be born, to enter puberty, to come under the influence of that sexual instinct, and to procreate, and then to die. And that's it. There's no reward for the consciousness. There's no reward for the soul. This is why humanity keeps repeating the same cycles over and over and over. Because mechanical nature is just a cycle that begins in the simplest forms of elements in nature and hits its peak in the intellectual animal kingdom, which we are in. To go beyond that requires that we revolt against nature. To have a revolution, to conquer nature, to be a king or queen of nature, as the Bible calls us to be to follow the order of Melchizedek, to turn back the influence of the moon and come under the influence of the sun. This is why all the great religions always have a solar hero, a solar god, Ra, Apollo, Jupiter, Christ, Avalokiteshvara, Chinrezig, Quetzalcoatl, these are all solar gods. Heracles is another one. Solar gods because they represent the influence of Christ, the Ein Sof Or, the solar light, the absolute, the prana, the emptiness, shunyata, the void. This is far beyond mechanical nature. This force is far beyond the I, the ego, it is beyond individuality. It is of supra-individuality. It is the level of God and beyond God. When we 
learn the science of Da'at or highest yoga tantra. We're learning the science to incarnate that force, to become a vessel, a vehicle of Christus Lucifer, Christ. Jupiter. This force that seeks to radically eliminate all impurity and to create a perfect vessel, a bodhisattva, a diamond soul, which is perfectly pure. And this is why Jesus says, ye must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the only way to enter heaven. No idolater, no fornicator, no adulterer, no thief, no murderer can enter heaven. And we have all those elements in our mind. Those elements cannot enter Shamayim, heaven, the superior waters which are above. So we have to separate these elements in ourselves and to enter the kingdom of heaven. The moon is a producer of suffering because we remain hypnotized by the collective psyche, by collective mind. We merely imitate. Thus, when we first enter this knowledge, we are called imitatus, one who imitates. We have to become adeptus, which means a product of one's own work, one's own hands, to do the work ourselves. We cannot be saved by anyone. Buddha can't save us. Jesus can't save us. We have to do the work ourselves. When we do that, then Christ can help us, and then Christ can save us. But we have to do our part. When we are merely imitating, following along through our three brains, the rest of humanity, we remain following that mechanical cycle, which will merely end in death. And all along the way, all we do is complicate our karma. Every little action we produce, physically, emotionally, mentally, produces results. If those actions are being produced by our egos, by our pride, by our lust, by our envy, the results will be pain, suffering. Because as we sow, so shall we reap. This is a very serious issue. It's not a game. It's not a theory. That's why, that's why Gnosis is practical. These three keys of suffering we have to apply to our moment-to-moment -moment life. To learn how to unlock the cage that we have made. And that cage is our own mind. It's not enough to merely believe in a religion or a doctrine or a teaching or an idea. We have to live it. And that living it is moment to moment. To work with what we have of purity and to strengthen that purity. Even though we have a lot of problems, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of pain, a lot of doubt, we have a potential door to exit suffering. That doorway is not in any religion. It's not in any church. It's not in any temple. It's not even in any book. It's in our consciousness. In Gnosis, we call it the essence. It is a spark of pure consciousness, an embryo, like a baby. In Buddhism, they call this Tathagatagarbha, or Buddhatadatu. And this is, in English, called the Buddha nature. It is the potential to become a Buddha, but it is not a Buddha. It's the seed. It's the spark that can start the great blaze. 
If in our moment-to-moment -moment existence we learn how to use that spark to activate it, to awaken our consciousness, to pay attention, to be mindful, we start to stimulate the growth of that embryo. And this is why all the ancient mystery schools required students to awaken their consciousness before they could receive the mysteries. It's required. Things have changed now. There's no more time for that. That changed in the last century. We have to learn to awaken that consciousness. To no longer just go along with the flow of mechanical life. But it doesn't do any good if you just listen to these lectures and read the scriptures and the texts and say, yeah, that sounds right, it makes sense. If you don't use it, if you don't do it, you have to practice it continually, constantly, making that effort. The essence, the consciousness, this Buddha nature, is a spark that comes from Tiferet. This is manas in Sanskrit. This is related with the human soul, the spark of that human soul that we can develop. As Jesus says, if we have patience, we will possess our soul. That spark can be developed if we understand the three foundations of the path. To use these three keys to unlock the door of suffering. To do that, we have to stop imitating. Just belonging to a group doesn't save us. Calling ourselves Gnostic or Hebrew or Jewish or Buddhist is just a label. We're still subject to the mechanical laws of nature. We have to escape those mechanical laws to enter the next kingdom, the conscious kingdom of humanity. To do that, we have to master the waters. We have to emulate the example of Jesus and walk on the waters. To emulate the example of Buddha and raise the serpent seven times in order to be protected, to rise upon the waters and to be protected from the rain, the karma, and thereby awaken. And that way, we can see the doorway out. In Gnosis, this first key, or first way out of suffering, we relate to the psychological work. It begins there. There's no other way. A belief doesn't change anything. Neither does a theory. Gnosis is a practical science. We want to experience the truth, not to just imagine it, but to experience it. Gnosis is like the first time you get burned by a flame. It's a shocking moment. That shock is what Gnosis is, if we use it, because it does shock the consciousness and the mind when we discover the truth about ourselves and the truth about nature. It's a shock, but we need that. We need that light to penetrate the darkness of our interior. In Buddhism, they say the path has three foundations, or in other words, the path, the foundation of the path has three aspects. The first one is renunciation. This has nothing to do with renouncing a material object or going and hiding from society and living in the woods or the mountains. This is not renunciation. This is a mere shift in physical circumstances. The renunciation has to be in the mind, in the heart. That's the real renunciation. In this context, we would say that renunciation, real renunciation, is to renounce the moon, the mechanical influence of the moon, to be willing to swim against the stream of life, 
To do that, you have to be a warrior, a fighter. You have to be strong and brave. This is why Tiferet, our consciousness, is always symbolized by a warrior. And if you look on the Tree of Life, you see that Tiferet is influenced by the sun and by Venus. Because the warrior always fights for his king, the sun, and his love, Venus. And his love is the soul, the divine consciousness, Guinevere, Buddhi, Gebera on the Tree of Life. This is Helen. Helen that the Greeks fought for because her beauty was so great. That beautiful soul is our divine consciousness, the divine soul, the spiritual soul that Solomon sings about in the Song of Songs. The divine soul is buddhi in Sanskrit and is that beautiful mirror that can reflect the contents of the universe, that mirror that's in our own waters. When we cleanse our own waters through renunciation, we start to gain the ability to see in that mirror, the magic mirror of the soul. To cleanse the waters through renunciation means to fight against our instinct, our animal inheritance in our bloodstream, the nefesh, the animal soul. Esau from the Bible, who sells his birthright for a plate of beans. This is what we do. We just want to eat. Our lust wants to eat. Our greed wants to eat. Our fear, who wants a sense of security, to feel saved, to feel safe, to feel secure, to feel like one of the group, to feel welcome, to feel accepted, praised by others. We want that. We want that in our spiritual lives. We want to belong to a group where we feel good about ourselves, where we feel like we belong, like we're safe. Now we're in this group, and everything's going to be okay, and I'm going to come out of suffering. We want to feel that. Or we want our family to accept us. We, want, we don't want to go against our family's desires to have children and then grandchildren, to get rich, to have a boat, to have a nice house, to follow the course of the centuries, which leads directly into the grave. We don't want to go against all that. The ego does not want that. The ego wants to belong. To go against that, we have to be a warrior. To fight against that psychological moon and create a new moon inside. A new moon that can reflect the contents of the sun, Christ. That new moon is the soul. The solar bodies, which reflect the contents of the universe. Renunciation in that context has really two fundamental aspects. In order to fight against the moon and our own inner Eve, that instinct to eat of the tree. We have to first transform that sexual force to change Eve, to transform Eve so she can return back to Eden. The only way Adam and Eve, our brain and our sex, can enter back into Eden is through the same door they left, which is sex, by respecting the tree of knowledge. Da'at, Gnosis. This is the superior waters, the Shamayim. The Mayim that has the Shin in it, the fire. Through Tantra, through sexual magic or sexual transmutation, we harness those divine forces of the Holy Spirit which reside in the sexual waters. We return that energy back to God, made pure, without any animal lust, without desire, clean. This becomes the purified wine of the ritual of the marriage. When Christ turns the waters into wine, that wine of light 
is the basis upon which we rise up to heaven. The wine that intoxicates the soul with divine things, which creates ecstasy or samadhi. Now here you see the beautiful relationship between these two parts of renunciation. The first part I'm explaining is transmutation of the sexual waters. Removing the impurities from our sexual waters through transmutation. But mere transmutation alone is not enough. We know of many monks and nuns and priests who conserve their sexual energy. Most don't transmute it because they don't learn that science. But some learn it. But even that isn't enough. Transmutation on its own harnesses that energy, but that energy has to be directed. It has to be guided, to be used. That's why the other part of transmutation is meditation. These must proceed hand in hand. If you're transmuting your sexual energy, you must be meditating and utilizing that energy in the right way. Otherwise, that energy will be harnessed by your ego. Through the process of meditation, you deepen the mindfulness, the wakefulness of the consciousness that you develop during the day. The first aspect of renunciation, always be watching yourself, watching yourself, watching yourself, watching. That's renunciation of impressions. The impressions of life that come from inside and outside. To renounce the instinct, the desires of the ego, to watch them. Then we learn to transform the sexual energy by harnessing and conserving that energy, changing it through the science of transmutation. Then we have to meditate. And in meditation, we deepen that watchfulness by removing all external phenomena from the picture. We introvert the consciousness and look within. Then we start to look at the roots of those mechanical elements that push us during the day and in our dreams to meditate. This combination of efforts begins to still the waters so that the waters of our sex and mind begin to calm. Right now, they're a chaos. Most of us can't stop thinking for an instant. We can't control our thoughts. We can't have silence in the mind for an instant. There are two causes for that. Well, there's one cause, but two aspects. That one cause is the ego, desire. The two aspects are the impressions that are always coming in from life that we don't consciously transform. We don't receive them with consciousness. We receive them mechanically. Then we fornicate and we stimulate and stir up all the desires in the mind and we pollute the waters through these two things. That's why when we try to meditate, it's so hard. It's painful because our mind is full of pain. When we observe that mind, we transform that energy, both psychological and sexual energy, and we meditate. The mind begins to calm. You can't remove any one of these pieces from the puzzle, and these pieces are universal to every religion, to every practice. If you merely meditate, you will have a wild mind all the time. If you don't pay attention to yourself from moment to moment, your mind will always be out of control. You might be able to make a supreme effort and go on a long retreat for three or five or seven or ten days and maybe get some taste of the stable mind of shamatha. But then as soon as you leave that environment, your mind will go back to being a chaos. 
because you're still doing the same mechanical things. Likewise, you might transmute your sexual energy. But if you don't meditate, your mind will always be a chaos. But then your situation will become even worse because the ego will begin grabbing all that sexual energy and using it to feed itself. This becomes a problem. Likewise, you might meditate, you might transmute your sexual energy, but if you don't observe yourself and work with your consciousness during the day, you'll be frustrated because that mind will still be out of control. Because you are not enforcing your conscious will moment to moment. So that mind will not settle. By applying all three, these are three aspects of renunciation. I know I said two before, but I'm breaking it a little, make it a little simpler, I hope. By applying all three of these, little by little, the mind starts to settle on its own. There's no need to force the mind. And forcing the mind can be a real problem, too. Some people learn to meditate, and they try to force the mind to be silent. It does not work. It will not happen. The mind will settle on its own and become calm and smooth and serene. Right? This is all just step number one. The first key or the first aspect of the foundations of the path. The second one is called bodhicitta. The word bodhicitta has levels of meaning. The common literal meaning is that compassionate aspiration to serve others. It's a type of mind that wants to serve others. This is the common interpretation of bodhicitta. And the Sanskrit literally breaks down into wisdom mind or awakening mind. But in Tantra, the meaning is much deeper. Bodhicitta in Tantrism means sexual energy. So if you've studied Himalayan Tantra, Tibetan Tantra, any of the schools of Tantra from the north, you will know that. Right there in that term, you see mind and sex are inseparable. You cannot work with the mind unless you work with sex. You must work with both. When that bodhicitta is understood by us, then we can see why it's the second step. Bodhicitta has many, many aspects and levels that we could go into. But it has, it has two fundamental qualities that we have to understand. Real bodhicitta, whether it's the relative or absolute bodhicitta, is always a combination of two wings, two, fa two facets. The first one is cognizant love. cognizant love. This is not blind love. And this is not love with attachment. This is Christ love, Christic love. In other words, Chinrezi, Christ. When you look at the upper regions of the tree of life, there's only one law. That law is love. But that is the pure light of Christ, the Ainsof Or. This is a kind of love that has no eye, no desire. And it's that love that we see exemplified in the actions of all the greatest teachers of humanity. Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, Guru Rinpoche, Quetzalcoatl. Whichever great teacher, Moses, all of these teachers exemplify this profound selfless love. But it's very cognizant. It's very intelligent. It isn't stupid. That's the first aspect of bodhicitta. 
when you study a Mahayana school of teaching, a medium scope school, what you're studying is how to cultivate bodhicitta. And they begin with this aspect, compassion. And so students of those traditions learn techniques to help them develop more love and compassion. The second aspect of bodhicitta is the comprehension of prana, which means the emptiness, the void. Prana means the wisdom of the beyond. It's spelled P-R-A-J-N-A. -A. The prana is the wisdom of Christ, the knowledge, the intelligence. And see, these two spheres here, Bina and Hokma, are intelligence and wisdom. This is prana. This is far beyond mechanical nature, far beyond any eye, and is free of desire. It is perfect. It is pure. In the Gnostic Gospels, it's called the incorruptible. We call it Christ. You can call it Avalokiteshvara or Kuku Khan. Any number of names apply to this force, this light. The one who's working with the first aspect of the foundation of the path, renunciation, must then begin to work with the second aspect or foundation of the path, which is bodhicitta. That bodhicitta begins by developing compassion for others. In other words, in the first stage of renunciation, we begin to renounce the mechanical moon in us, the instinct of self-preservation, of self-interest, of selfishness, lust and envy and greed and fear and pride and all of those things that make life hell. We go against that in renunciation. And in bodhicitta, we begin to consider what's best for others. This is how we start really transforming the mind. Through that, we start to develop the understanding of what Christ is. And that becomes the third of the three foundations of the path. Emptiness, the void, the absolute. The absolute is here at the top of the tree of life. In Hebrew, it's the Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof Or that limitless light that emerges from the nothingness, which is something, but it's not something that we can conceive. The emptiness is the void, shunyata, which is indescribable, but can be experienced. It can only be experienced by the consciousness that is free of ego. desire in any form, whether it's the desire that shows itself as pride or as lust or as sanctity or as a spiritual ego or a Christian ego or a Buddhist ego, none of those things can come anywhere near the absolute. Only the completely pristine consciousness, pure absolutely free of even the sense of self that can see the absolute and taste it and it's terrifying because in that experience you see that you do not exist the you that you believe in that you worship that you feed and clothe and dress and protect every day is not real that I is a lie that you crafted in order to hide your own vulnerabilities, your pain, your doubts, your fear, your weakness, your lust. The experience of the void radically shatters any illusion of self. This is the third foundation of the path.
I hope you have all that because we'll go a little deeper now. The three keys of suffering that we described, the moon, Eve, and the turbid waters, are the results, the karma. We put ourselves in this situation through the mind. I'm talking about these three keys of suffering in ourselves, not in nature outside, in us. We made them because we are identified with sensations. We are attached to the sense of self that we have. We believe very much in the name that we have, in our history, in our past, in the abuses we've suffered at the hands of others. We never remember the abuses we gave to other people, only the ones that we received. We're very much attached to our iPod, to our computer, to our clothing, to our music, to our language, to our religion, to our friends, family, children, all of these things, very attached to things that are impermanent, to things that fundamentally cannot exist, but only transiently. They don't exist fundamentally, inherently, in and of themselves, permanently. They are temporary. And yet we invest everything into them, this idea of self, which is constituted by this whole range of psychological elements that we call me. This is why Jesus says, lay not up your treasures on earth where thieves can break in to steal them or rust can corrupt them. But put your treasures into heaven. Heaven is Shamayim in Hebrew, the superior waters. In a recent lecture, we described how Mayim, the inferior waters related with Eden, can be elevated to become Shamayim, the superior waters of heaven, when Shin is put into the Mayim. And Shin is the Hebrew letter with three arms, which symbolizes the three forces the Logos, the Christ. When we harness that force, the Christic force in our sexual energy, and we perfect that water, it becomes Shamayim. Heavenly waters, fiery waters, literally speaking. This is how we put our treasure into heaven. Our treasure is our consciousness. It's the most valuable thing that we have. That spark or essence which has descended into matter and is now suffering inside the cage of the eye. Learning this science through the foundations of the path, we can unlock the keys of suffering. We can radically change. But this requires a tremendous battle against ourselves. We think the battle is against society, against the established religions, against our parents or our friends or our colleagues. But these are all insignificant. The greatest enemy we will ever face is our own mind. Our own mind is the deceiver the adversary, Satan, Shaitan. Our own mind is the devil who's hypnotizing us from moment to moment with his many trinkets and toys that are always just over the horizon. If I work a little bit longer, I can save a little more money and then I can have happiness. If I do this, then I can have that. If I wait just a little longer, after I retire, I'll start taking this more seriously. After college, when I'm not so busy anymore, then I'll take Gnosis seriously. We have a lot of excuses. And it's very sad how we deceive ourselves, annoying, uh, 
avoiding the inevitability of death and remaining in complete ignorance of what happens after death, having no clue that there is existence beyond death and it is not what we think it is. It's determined by karma, by the causes we ourselves have put into place. Therefore, it's beholden unto us to know how to enter the path. The three foundations of the path are made very distinct from any other activity in life by a single fact. They do not produce suffering. This is a very deep thing. Very deep. And it will escape your immediate analysis. So I suggest you reflect on that very deeply. All of the other activities of life, as noble and as beautiful as they may appear to the senses, can result in suffering. And most of the time they do because we don't have our consciousness awakened. We don't know what is acting through our three brains and why, because we're asleep. We sleep and we do not know. But if we awaken, then we can know. Through those three foundations, the three fundamental aspects Renunciation, bodhicitta, and the wisdom of the emptiness. We can completely escape from suffering. There's no doubt. Because all of those intelligences that have escaped suffering escaped by this means. They may have used different names different ways of organizing or presenting the doctrine or teaching that they've studied or belong to. But the principles are eternal. In other words, let me be a little more explicit. You can enter any religion, any philosophy, any mystical school. And if you're there to pursue security, a sense of belonging, a sense of self, to acquire powers, to acquire recognition, the gratitude of others, or attention from others, all of these things will produce suffering. You can be the most holy looking person, the ho most holy feeling person, and you will produce only suffering for yourself and others because the ego is still alive. As long as the ego is alive, the cause of suffering is alive. And that cause is in us, not in anyone else. We have to stop looking at the problems in other people and look in our own mind and change that. There are many people who come to Gnosis looking for these things. Powers, the ability to go in the astral plane consciously or other dimensions of nature or they want to impress other people with their knowledge, or they want to belong to a group where they feel saved, they feel secure, they feel like they belong to something special. These are desires. They're desires that produce suffering and that make schools toxic with ego. And every school suffers these problems, every Gnostic school. This is why we need to consider the path deeply, to consider ourselves deeply. What we need are these three foundations to renounce the desires of the mind, to generate cognizant love, selfless love, and to learn about the emptiness the fundamental nature of reality is the void. This third point is easy to misunderstand. 
most religions and schools teach about something about renunciation and something about love. But understanding the emptiness is very difficult, especially for the intellect. Because all the intellect can do is compare A and B, yes and no, maybe, I don't know. To understand the emptiness is to get at the roots of the tree of life. The roots are in the unknown. Existence emerges out of nothingness into somethingness. And that emergence is the explosion of the ray of creation, which explodes out of the womb of the Divine Mother as that first birth. That ray of light, the emptiness, the absolute, is at the very base of our existence, not only physically and outside, but as a soul, as a consciousness. When we talk about the doctrine of no self, the doctrine of no I, it means that in every dimension of nature, any sense of self or any sense of I that we feel is ultimately empty of truth because it's dependent on other factors. It doesn't exist inherently. The only thing that exists inherently in and of itself is the absolute, which is a non-existence. It is a level of existence that escapes duality. It is far beyond duality. You can never say, well, is it existent or non-existent? Because it is both. The mind cannot grasp that. It can play with the ideas but until you've experienced that, you can't understand. You can experience that if you learn to meditate. Anyone can experience the emptiness if you learn how to meditate properly, which means take your consciousness out of every bottle that it is in. The bottle of the physical body, the ethereal, astral, mental, causal, buddhic and atomic bodies. Pull the consciousness out of those. But before you can do any of those, you have to take the consciousness out of your pride, your envy, your lust, your greed, your gluttony. Even the desire for that experience cannot be there. All that can be there is being. The state of being. The state of being. And when you touch that, there's a shock. And you can open the door to the absolute and experience the true fundamental nature of existence. This is such an important point because by comprehending the nature of the absolute, the true nature of our own self, we have very powerful weapons that we can use against the ego. As long as we believe that our real self is somewhere else there's a trap there waiting for us and a lot of Gnostics fall into this trap a lot of Gnostics study the mysticism the religions and the all these esoteric things and they hear about our inner father our real being Chesed Atman the innermost all these terms to describe this inner self and they build that inner self into a god, an idol, and believe they are that. This is how we have mythomania, a mystical self. And this is why we have so many people on this planet who proclaim themselves to be great masters, avatars, and guides of humanity who are really just fooling themselves with a subtle eye. We should not fall into that trap. And by comprehending the nature of the emptiness, we can comprehend the true nature of self and not fall into that trap. Any eye produces suffering, even if it's a mystical eye. Do you have any questions?
just say that this guy was born with a pitchfork and a ponytail and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have inherited from some of the religions on this planet the concept of Satan as a person or a figure who's outside of us. This was an intentional perversion of the original doctrine of Christ. This idea of supposedly Lucifer or Satan or the devil in that way. Let me tell you, that person, that, that creature does not exist in the way that it's taught in the, in, in the literal way, in the common way. We agree that there are devils, but we are the devils. And there are devils worse than us. And they're written about in the Bible and in the Tantras and in the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata and all these scriptures. There are many forms of devils and demons and creatures who have power in Klipot or Ivici. The real devil is our own mind. Any one of us can arrive at the direct experience of that, of knowing that. If you take this seriously, this science, this is a very common experience that students will report early on in their efforts. To uh, so One example would be some students see themselves in an, in an experience out of the body where their consciousness is awakened and they see themselves in a mirror and they look like the devil. They look like a horrible demon or Frankenstein or some other just awful, awful thing. And this kind of experience can be very disturbing because when you see yourself as you are, it's extremely uncomfortable. That, that image has nothing to do with the image we like to think of ourselves as or that we like others to think we are. The true reality of our inner psychological state is horrific. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, in the myth of Cupid and Psyche and Eros and Psyche, um, Eros is often considered to be the uh, personification of desire. How would you read that? Well, in the myth of Cupid and Psyche, or Eros and Psyche, there are multiple um, interpretations of that story. And if you read the edition of the version that's given um, by Apuleius in the Metamorphosis, you'll discover a very interesting psychological teaching about the state of our mind. So I suggest you read and study that. Um, but in general, when you look into the Greek mythology, you see that Eros was one of the first to emerge from creation. And Eros is Lucifer, the bearer of light. That light is the force that allows everything to be created. It's Eros, love, sex. This is the meaning of that. That light that emerges comes through the Elohim, the gods and goddesses who unite in order to produce their offspring. And that first offspring is Eros, love. But unfortunately, Psyche, our soul, uh, is a bit mystified by this. And so the Greek myth shows how we fall asleep as a result of this hypnosis we, by being um, naive, just like Eve in the garden. We have a kind of naivety about ourselves and about our energy. That's why Psyche falls asleep. And so that symbolizes the state of our own soul now. Our soul is asleep. Our consciousness is asleep. We think we're awake because we're up and about doing everything that we do. And we don't realize that our soul is deeply asleep. And to awaken it requires a lot of effort. Another interesting variation on that is the story of Snow White. When the witch, who symbolizes the fornicating Eve, seduces Eve or seduces the innocent part of the soul with the apple and puts her to sleep. And this symbolizes the two aspects of that feminine nature that we have within, right? The upper and the lower. That seduction, the apple, is the same apple symbolized in the Garden of Eden. 
It's sexual. And that hypnosis is happening in us all the time. Any other questions? offset it by a prayer or by some positive thoughts? Not necessarily. The warrior, the consciousness that has to do battle against Medusa, who is our own ego, that feminine aspect that's inverted. Because you know Medusa in the myth was once a virgin, virginal like Eve. But because of jealousy and envy, she fell and sprouted all those serpents, which symbolize the serpent power of the Divine Mother in Klipop. All those serpents on her head are all the egos, the sexual power used by all the egos. When the hero comes to kill Medusa, he can only do it because Athena, his Divine Mother, who's upright, who, by the way, carries a spear, the, the spine, the shield, and gives the sword, the shield and the helmet, to the hero. The symbol of the Divine Mother Athena is a serpent, by the way. She wears a girdle of serpents, right? Those armaments are these techniques that we're teaching you. Self-observation and self-remembering, meditation, and transmutation. The shield, the helmet to protect the mind, and the sword. When we use those in the right way, we have to battle against Medusa. That means that you have to have a strategy that will change from moment to moment. Those armaments are psychological, conscious. You have to be conscious of yourself to use them. So when Medusa, your own Medusa, is tempting you or attacking you through thoughts, through feelings, through impulses in the body, you have to have, first of all, self-awareness and to remember your Divine Mother. If you remember her, then she will aid you and give you those armaments. Do you remember how he defeats Medusa? He doesn't look at her, because if he does, he'll turn to stone. Right? In other words, he will become fixed and rigid in nature, mechanical, only doing the same things over and over, no flexibility, no ability to change, like the pillar of salt of the wife of Lot. He becomes instead crystallized in hell, a stone. But the hero in the story, instead, of looking at her directly uses his shield which is polished like a mirror which is meditation by using his shield he can look at Medusa that shield is the polished surface of his own water his own psychological and sexual water and by that means he can conquer the tempting devil so from that point of view, the warrior can then use whatever tools are necessary intuitively. If thoughts are very strong and coming at you, you have to listen to your Divine Mother to know the antidote. We have many antidotes that we study in this tradition. We have the second jewel of the yellow dragon, which is the using the duality of the mind against itself. It's a kind of psychological judo. This is a very difficult technique to master and very confusing for the intellect to learn, but very effective when you do learn it. We have prayers, we have conjurations, we have mantras, all of which can arm the warrior to do battle. But the one who will guide you in the use of those tools is your Divine Mother. And the only way she can do that is if you're listening. Listening from moment to moment. As an example, Let's say that you feel tempted to watch a program on television which has very negative imagery. And you feel that in your blood, that urge 
to watch. Maybe it's violence, maybe it's pornography. Maybe something else. Most of the time, we just go along with it. We think, eh, no one's going to know. What's the harm? And so we watch that. And the result is suffering. Because we take the conscious energies that we're being given from God in, from moment to moment, and we're implanting those in our desires. We're feeding our lust. We're feeding our violence. We're feeding our anger. No good will come of that. But if instead we become aware of ourselves and observe ourselves and see that animal instinct in the blood, in the mind, in the sex, and we pray, and we remember God, and we remember that God is always there. We might forget God, but God doesn't forget us. We like to think we can do whatever we want and get away with anything, but God is always there. And it's interesting to me that we think God's only there when we pray. Only in the moment we say, okay, God, okay, now I want to talk to you. And we start praying whatever we're going to pray. But then later we see pornography or we see violence or we see, we start getting into our desire for money or some other thing and we start thinking about that. And we think God's not there. To me, this is a funny thing about the ego, that it fools us like that. To think, oh, well, God's not here right now, so I can get away with it. When you pray in those moments and you remember your being, immediately that ego is partly disempowered. When you really remember yourself, you remember the divinity that's within you. Immediately, much of that poison in the blood, that instinct pulling you, is dispelled. It may not be conquered completely, but from that point, you can apply other tools, like you asked about. Might be conjurations, might be prayers, might be taking a walk, might be calling a loved one, might be doing something to sacrifice for another person instead of feeding your desire. There are many ways you can transform an impression and turn it into something good. But that only comes with that guidance that you receive intuitively from your Divine Mother. And that only comes if you're paying attention. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.